Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Michael Collins, and I'm the Director General of the Institute of International and European Affairs here in Dublin. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to this, our latest IIEA webinar. We are really delighted that so many of you could join us uh, for this occasion, uh, those of you here in Ireland, around Europe, in the United States, and indeed uh, beyond. This event is part of our Future of the EU 27 project, which is sponsored by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and is jointly organized with the European Commission representation here in Ireland. We're greatly honored to be joined uh, today by European Commissioner for Trade, Phil Hogan. Commissioner Hogan will speak to us uh, for about uh, 15 minutes or so, and then we will go directly to your questions and uh, his answers. And you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send your questions as they occur to you, and we will put as many as we can to the Commissioner in the time available. Uh, today's presentation and the Q&A are both on the record, and please feel free also to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. We're also live streaming this uh, lunchtime discussion, so a very warm welcome to not only those of you on Zoom, but also those of you who are tuning in via YouTube. Phil Hogan, our Commissioner, the Commissioner was appointed Commissioner for Trade in 2019 under the new Commission of President Ursula von der Leyen. And the Commissioner previously served as Commissioner for Agriculture and Rural Development uh, from 2014 uh, to 2019. Prior to this, Commissioner Hogan uh, was a member of the Irish Government, was Ireland's Minister for the Environment, Community and Local Government from 2011 and 2014, and Chairman of his party, the Fine Gael Party, uh, EPP, uh, between 1995 and 2001. He was first elected to the Irish Parliament, the Dáil, in 1989. Commissioner Hogan, you're warmly welcome. Kate Bina Falcha, you're warmly welcome to this IAE event. The platform is now yours. In you. Uh, so, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to participate uh, in this event organised by what you've said, Michael, the Institute of International and European Affairs in Dublin. I'm very grateful for the IEA and the Commission in coming together as part of this Citizens' Dialogue. Uh, it's the first time to participate in a, an IEA event in this way since I became Commissioner, but we're all getting used to it at the moment in, tele in terms of video conferencing and teleworking, uh, like all of the workers and businesses that must do the same. So from the point of view of where I stand, uh, the Commissioner for Trade, I, I welcome this opportunity to contribute about what is happening and what might be happening and my views of the future in terms of trade. So I'm convinced, of course, that international trade has a critically important role to play in economic recovery. And I will explain this during the course of my few words and I'm sure in the questions and answers. What's also true is that we do need to learn lessons from this crisis and to apply them in forming a kind of trade policy that we want in the future. But first of all, I want to take an opportunity, Michael, to congratulate you uh, on your appointment as Director General of the IEA, following a very distinguished diplomatic career. I think the IEA are very lucky to have you uh, available to them, and you bring a wealth of knowledge and experience to your role, all of which is very important in tackling the challenges that lie ahead. I also want to take the opportunity to express my sympathy to all of the families who are suffering bereavement, or indeed, have somebody close to them that's very ill at the moment, arising from this health pandemic. Addressing any problem or challenge, of course, I suppose, like we have today, arise, uh, requires a health metaphor, a diagnosis of that problem or challenge. And while the immediate challenge uh, continues to be the public health one, with which our health systems around the world are contending, there's a huge economic challenge as well building up. And the Commission and the governments of the EU are been very active in implementing emergency measures to support the respective economies and to preserve as many jobs as possible. But our, fortunately, it's not always possible uh, when you close down production and consumption at the same time. The Commission analysis estimates a 9.7% decrease in global trade for 2020. And for the EU27, the predicted COVID-19 related economic contraction results in a reduction of 9.2% in exports of goods and services and an 8.8% .8 decrease in imports, the EU27, in 2020 as well. So in absolute terms, this 
means or this amounts to a fall in exports of around 285 billion euros and a fall of imports of around 240 billion euro. So because of the volatility of this situation, um, our Department of Trade in Brussels is aiming to update our trade forecast based on the latest information available by the end of this month. But today the European Commission has indicated what its true spring forecast, what the economic indicators are for 2020. And then they published them today, it's predicting a 7.4% reduction in GDP in 2020 and a major increase in unemployment in every member state. And indeed every member state is going to be in recession in 2020. So that's not exactly great news, but it's not, I'm sure, a surprise to anybody. But the essential point is that the global economy is subject to a profound and unprecedented shock. And the public health and the economic challenges, which are closely linked, it's clear now that we rely on the global arteries of trade to deliver vital goods like medical equipment and food to where they are needed most. And equally, the investment needed in the future to reinforce our public health capacity will require functioning economies with robust, resilient, and sustainable supply and value chains. The choices that we make in the coming months uh, will determine not only our success in defeating the virus, which of course is the prerequisite, but also the speed of our post-corona economic recovery. And our pre-corona virus, in, in, at that stage, international trade was one of the drivers of growth in the European Union. But post-corona, we must build on our strengths and improve our trade performance. And the European Union's strength and economic prosperity is built on openness, both within our single market and in our global action. And our openness before the crisis ranked about, about you know, one of the highest in the world, with 35 million European jobs depending on exports and 16 million jobs depending on European investment. So, in other words, one out of seven jobs was depending on exports and, and, and foreign direct investment into the European Union. And in fact, in Germany and in Ireland, that figure is a remarkable one in four. This is two thirds more than in the year 2000. So that sets the context of where we are in terms of exports and imports and uh, economic indicators. But trade is very important for our European small and medium-sized enterprises. And our Eurostat statistics show that 615,000 SMEs exported goods to various destinations around the world in 2019. This represents 87% of all EU exporting EU companies. So by any measure, SMEs are the driving force of EU export performance. Trade is not only, of course, about exports, it's also about imports, uh, which are essential for a competitive and a technologically advanced economy, which is trying to provide high quality jobs and develop and manufacture cutting edge products and satisfy consumer needs. And the EU single market is in itself an illustration of the fundamental benefits that trade brings. And for a continent as poor in raw materials as Europe, self-sufficiency therefore is objectively not an option and imports are indispensable. There are lessons to be learned, of course, uh, but we need to review our dependencies and ensure the resilience of our supply chains, but particularly in the health area. Uh, some dependence and vulnerabilities have been exposed here in the health area. We weren't ready, but nobody was ready in relation to this pandemic. And therefore we need to ensure that we support these vulnerabilities uh, by looking carefully at what we have to do in order to ratchet up production with internally in the European Union but also to ensure that we have a stable and rules-based trading order as well, because we need a lot of the imports for these particular health products from outside the European Union, and that's likely to continue in the foreseeable future. The challenge, as President von der Leyen and President Charles Michel of the European Council stated in the Roadmap for Recovery, which they published recently, is to reduce trade dependencies on areas that make us vulnerable, and instead to invest in strategic value chains and build more resilient infrastructure. So, we need to diversify. We shouldn't be dependent on one geographical region. We need to solidify our supply chains, uh, and that's the safest and most efficient way to respond to all sorts of crisis situations, not just repeats of the current pandemic. If more countries pursue the track of self-sufficiency, it will increase competition for scarce resources, drive up prices, and deepen international hostilities. And I think that would be a lose-lose situation to our people and for our economies. So what we are advocating is a, is, is a model of what we call open strategic autonomy. So what does that mean? Simply put, it means achieving the right balance between a Europe that is open for business, that promotes open rules-based approach, and a Europe that protects its people and businesses in areas where we're vulnerable. 
So on the one hand, we will remain committed to a fair and open and rules-based trade situation to make our economy more competitive and dynamic, pursuing our sustainability goals and securing our position in the world. And on the other, we must strengthen our armory so that no one can take advantage of our openness. The European single market is the most open economic situation in the world, but this means we can be vulnerable. So we have to have a necessary robust enforcement actions available so that we, we get what we bargain for in our trade agreements and that we protect our economy from hostile actions. So we're upgrading our trade defence instruments in that regard. I think this is the right time to make the case for global cooperation uh, so that it can be stronger and more forthright. This is the time for the EU to show leadership in this area by leading the global efforts to reform the multilateral trade framework, like the WTO, by enhancing the transatlantic cooperation for a sustainable recovery, which we are doing with the United States, and by securing market access opportunities abroad, by having more free trade agreements, and we need more of them. We also need to protect the European Union's openness against abuse and unfair trade, as I've said, by enhancing our toolbox in relation to trade defence instruments. And we have to be mindful, of course, of what our citizens demand of us in terms of the European Green Deal and our commitments to sustainability, as well as in the promotion of the digital economy and digital trade. So the European Commission has been active on the trade agenda since this crisis emerged, and I just want to briefly say a few words about this. We've implemented two export authorization schemes for exports of person, personal protective equipment outside of the European Union. These measures are very short term, they're targeted, uh, for products uh, that are in short supply. And the second measure we have taken in recent days was to narrow down the scope of this to a small number of health products uh, and adjust the ge geographical application to include the Western Balkans. So this measure is just about three weeks left to run and after that we will decide whether we need it again. So analysis of the first week of operation of this scheme uh, in early April indicates that over 90% of the applications for export authorizations were granted by member states so it wasn't an export ban. These included authorizations in respect of exports to countries all over the world, including in Africa and Asia, and including export authorizations that were granted for exports to the United States. In fact, the United States was one of the top destinations for export authorizations in all of the three categories of products in the health area that were covered by the scheme. We've also in, recent, uh, we, in the last two weeks set up a clearinghouse for medical equipment for a period of six months it will allow us to look at the demand and supply of, for medical supplies. Uh, but of course, it's only as good as the information we get from the member states. So hopefully we'll get full cooperation from the member states so that we get a good picture about where the shortages are and that we can do something about it in quick order. So our conclusion based on the information that we have to date is that the scheme is operating well and as we had intended, and the member states who will consult with the clearinghouse in the case of more than 70 of the export authorization applications received will get a good service. Finding a path, of course, outside of, out of the crisis requires not only that we act together as a European Union, but act as a global community. And for that reason, we have been very active in various international formations like the G20. We had a recent meeting of the G20, and I proposed seven concrete proposals for immediate action, uh, a seven course menu as it were. Uh, and it also included trade facilitation, trade liberalization, export finance, reducing tariffs, and while the EU left its imprint on the G20 statement, we didn't get as much ambition as we would like. But we're not finished yet. There will be another meeting, hopefully, in two weeks' time. And we've been in touch with the Saudi Arabian presidency of the G20 in order to see can we do more here, particularly in reducing the costs of medical supplies through reducing VAT and reducing tariffs. We have already in the European Union applied a universal tariff and VAT suspension of medical equipment, easing the pressure on prices for medical and protective equipment. Because the European Union wants to forge a positive agenda with our international partners, and given that the European Union-United States transatlantic trade relationship remains the central artery of the world economy, I'm in regular contact with Washington to make a strong case for greater transatlantic cooperation. I've written in recent days again to the United States Trade Representative Ambassador Lighthizer to identify some leading principles where the US and the, Uni and the United States could work together to address the areas that have been impacted by trade policies and to help restore confidence and bring about a boost in economic activity maybe more quickly than would be the case otherwise. So I'm looking forward to a response from Ambassador Lighthizer in the coming days. I think this gives us an opportunity, this crisis, to revive our transatlantic uh, relationship between the EU and the United States and to put it on a sounder footing. I hope that that will be the case taken by the United States. 
So to conclude, um, um, Mr. Chairman, today, right across the Europe, uh, governments are taking tentative steps, as we know, to reopen their economies and their societies. All of this is being done with the objective of not compromising the progress that has been made today in the health area and then flattening the curve. Now we're being called on to assist one another to gradually reopen our economies and to reopen our communities in a safe way. And our various policies will contribute to our economic recovery and international trade will play its part. And we have the opportunity to use international uh, opportunities to complement the internal measures that we're taking within the European Union. And I think this can be achieved through what I've said earlier, the model of open strategic autonomy, which will build the foundations for resilience, for competitiveness and growth. So our leaders, I suppose, owe it to our people uh, who have sacrificed so much this year to be brave and to be outward looking and to be honest about the choices that we have to be, take in the months and years ahead. And I think that this is the true definition of leadership in a time of crisis. So thank you very much, Michael. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, for that um, very insightful, comprehensive and indeed um, uh, highly relevant uh, contribution um, uh, on, on the, this issue of international trade. And of course, you rightly say that, um, uh, that, that trade policy is, is central to economic recovery. How do you see that? I mean, trade policy, obviously, and getting trade going is going to take some time. So it, it, how, how do you think that, that, that trade can contribute uh, to economic recovery in any kind of meaningful uh, time scale? And I suppose just to touch on a, on, on a kind of a, a topical comment by, by, by President uh, Trump uh, the other day when he, he, in fact, he, 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 he name-checked Ireland in the context of um, uh, uh, perhaps the relocation of ph pharmaceutical, some aspects of the pharmaceutical industry uh, back to the United States, this question of repatriation or relocation of some of these strategic industries. Obviously, that's a sensitive issue. It's a sensitive issue for Europe. It's a sensitive issue for Ireland. But more broadly, I mean, just making sure or assuring that we can get trade to be the kind of the, um, the, the to, to energize the recovery. How do you see that happening in any kind of a reasonable time frame? Well, I suppose it's, there's, a, there's always a temptation at a time of crisis to close borders in every way and to, you know, go back into the bunker, as it were, in and, and, and terms of what, they need, what needs to be done. I think this would be a very much a wrong approach. We have a lot of temporary measures put in place now, like in the state aid rules uh, and like in trade measures, which we need to eliminate and lift those restrictions as quickly as possible in order to ensure that our global supply chains are open and that they're fair and they're rules-based uh, in line with the WTO rules. So therefore, keeping supply chains open to avoid protectionism is very important. As I've said earlier, we're short of raw materials in the European Union, and many people would be surprised, surprised at the extent of that. So the European Union needs imports too. So it's in our interest in our European economies to be able to remain open in a global way, or to have those imports in order to have our companies able to produce the, val the valuable products and the high quality products that they produce. Now, secondly, I think what we have to do is improve our trade defense instruments. So, for example, if a country wants to take advantage of our vulnerability at the moment and buy up some of our companies that will be, of course, in a difficult financial situation, we have to be able to help them. And therefore, reciprocal market access is very important. Foreign direct investment screening is very important. International procurement instruments are important. And we are developing those in a stronger way at the moment in order to ensure that we have those available in 2020. And uh, thirdly, I think, uh, we shouldn't get carried away with the notion of self-sufficiency because of what I said earlier, we need imports. But equally, we have to recognize that we have vulnerabilities and we have the need for to diversify. We cannot be all dependent on medical supplies from China or South Korea. We have to look at this. And it's worth noting that at the beginning of the coronavirus, there was only about 10 companies in Europe producing masks. Because of the work that Commissioner Breton did, uh, the Commissioner for the Internal Market, there's now about 550 companies producing masks for the pandemic. So this is a, a really a great contribution from the industrial production side of things in the European Union. And this is likely to be important in the future because people have to get back to work. They need to be safe. Uh, and also we need a reserve like we do for oil reserves, as we did in the 1970s for oil reserves. We had a 90-day supply arising from discussions at that time. And uh, now we, I think we need for these pandemics, and they'll probably be more regular in the future, we need to look at this in terms of having a resilient stockpile, stockpile of medical supplies for maybe 90 days as well. I also think we need to look very much at reforming the international organization system so it's more effective and efficient, like the WTO, in order to ensure that we get more speedier and quicker decisions. 
uh, and is enhancing the, the way that we do our trade through greater global cooperation. And we have done a lot of trade agreements uh, as well around the world. We have 40 trade agreements, the European Union, uh, and in 70 countries. So we can do better in terms of the benefits we can get for our SMEs in this respect. And uh, there's major opportunities there. And I think that we have to do more here to help our SMEs to get greater value. Now, the specific question that you mentioned about our friends in the United States and what they said about pharmaceuticals, this comes up on a regular basis uh, by the United States. It's not today or yesterday that they're pointing to this problem that they allegedly have in relation to pharmaceuticals being based in Ireland. And I regularly point out to them, in, uh, my friends in the United States, that, they're, you know, that American companies don't locate in Ireland for the, just for the fact that they love Ireland. They, they do so because they'll make money. Uh, and uh, the company shareholders have to get a dividend for the investments they make. And they save 1.7 billion euro in tariffs, the fact that they're located in Ireland or in the European Union. And that's, an, that's a significant amount of money. So that the 10 top pharma countries, uh, companies in the world are located in Ireland. So they cluster around the innovation and the research and development that they do. They cluster around a very highly qualified workforce that we have in Ireland. And it's not always recognized by the United States that about 60% of the products that are manufactured in places like Ireland, they go back to the United States for intermediate treatment. And then they come back into the European system again. So the figures of exports are often distorted by this movement of goods over and back uh, because they have to get additional treatment. And it's, uh, it is uh, it's often a, a controversial point that's been made uh, in relation to uh, the uh, balance of trade figures between the uh, Ireland and the United States. But the United States never includes services where they have a significant surplus with Ireland and they have a deficit on goods. But overall, there is a balanced trade between goods and services between the United States uh, and, the, uh, and, and, Ireland, and Ireland. But of course, when we're discussing trade arrangements between the United States and the European Union, all is fair in love and war and all comes into play. Uh, but I think that we need to have uh, the right basis for the arguments and the right basis for the figures. Thank you. Yeah, just uh, coming back to that last point before we go to questions from the floor, as it were. Um, obviously, you've described the transatlantic uh, trade as the central, central artery uh, of the world economy. How much more difficult is it going to be to achieve a transatlantic trade deal post-COVID? I mean, it was difficult enough <laughs> before COVID. Uh, how greater, how much more challenging is it going to be in this COVID environment to get a transatlantic deal? I hope that the United States will, will appreciate that you know, tariffs don't work because they reduce economic growth, reduce economic activity and, and actually limit jobs in terms of, uh, of our industry. And what we're trying to do now is reopen our economies and drive economic activity and growth. So therefore, we should be thinking about doing the opposite. So I hope that uh, you know, common sense will prevail and that we can reduce costs together in various sectors by re eliminating tariffs. And this is where I feel that the United States and the European Union can do a lot together as two of the major economic regions of the world. Uh, and we can do so within a plurilateral basis, uh, and we can do so within the rules and disciplines of the World Trade Organization. So we have been trying to build the relationship uh, since I took office on the 1st of December. We were making some progress in the first few months. Unfortunately, in the last few weeks, because of this pandemic, it's understandable that both the European Union and the United States have taken a breather. But I expect that we will get back speaking again next week. And I live in hope that we actually achieve something that will give the confidence to the world economy that at least the two major economies in the world are working together, keeping the business relationships uh, open and keeping the trade uh, routes open. It's worth noting, uh, Michael, not to be long-winded about it, that 60% or more of the foreign direct investment of the United States comes from the European Union. 55% of the foreign direct investment into the European Union comes from the United States. So whether we like it or not, we're very much interconnected and we have to ensure that that interconnectivity and global supply chains between us continue. It's in our interest economically and it's, in, it's more of our interest now more than ever. Okay, so uh, let's take a few questions here. One um, that's just come in from Justin McCarthy from the Irish Farmers Journal. Uh, he says, uh, Commissioner, uh, Germany represents 25% of the EU's GDP yet accounts for 52% of total state aid provided in response to COVID-19. Are you concerned that a relaxation of state aid rules threatens the single market by undermining the level playing field for businesses across member states? Well, I suppose this is an economic and financial response of the European Union uh, at the request of the member states about how we can actually 
uh, hold what we have in terms of the connectivity between employers and employees and keep companies alive in the short term. It's a temporary measure, these state aid relaxations uh, that are being given. And of course, the firepower of Germany as a very big economy is huge. And uh, I, I certainly expect that this will be analysed in the coming months to ensure that there is a restoration of the, the measures that were in place pre-COVID-19. Uh, and also we'll take account during the course of the MFF and during the course of the recovery fund of the capacity of member states, uh, uh, whether, they're in ability, whether their ability or inability to be able to provide this sort of firepower uh, is certainly something that we'll have to look at very carefully in the context of the envelopes that will be provided to member states in the post-economic recovery phase. So you're, you're, I agree with you totally, Justin, that this is a major amount of GDP uh, in terms of the financial firepower being implemented by Germany, uh, which other countries couldn't do that to the same extent. And we have to take account of that in the future budget discussions and in the future economic recovery measures that we'll be putting in place. Okay, um, just um, a query here from, or a question here from Lisa O'Carroll from the uh, Guardian, I think the Guardian Brexit correspondent. She said, um, she says, uh, Michael Gove yesterday floated the idea uh, that the UK might abandon its goal of zero tariff, zero quotas, unless EU budgets on its level playing field um, um, uh, demands. What would that mean for the EU? And would the EU have time given the coronavirus interruption to work out tariffs between now and December. And she says further, does the EU want an extension to the transition period? Well, I, I would hope that uh, Secretary Gove would negotiate uh, directly with Mr. Barnier and the team, uh, rather than negotiating in the airwaves or in the media in relation to these very sensitive issues. We're going to have to make difficult decisions at the end of June. We've waited a long time for the United Kingdom to come up with its mandate and to be ready for to negotiate with the European Union. We've been very patient in the European Union with the United Kingdom in terms of the slow pace that it has shown in relation to engaging uh, with the discussions. Uh, and we take account, of course, of the illness of the Prime Minister and uh, we hope that he continues to his full recovery. But I think that the place to do all of this work is at the table uh, of negotiations where there's been many opportunities which have not been taken uh, by, the, uh, by the United Kingdom in recent weeks. So we hope that in the next two rounds of negotiations, one of which will be next week, that we will see much more intensive work being done, much more engagement, so that the idea of even having to consider a transition won't, be, won't have to be considered at all. But as you know, that this issue will come to a head at the end of June, uh, when there's a high-level meeting between uh, the President of the Commission and the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Yeah, and just um, talking about the UK, just again uh, uh, briefly. Of course, they opened their own negotiations with the um, with the United States yesterday on the, on a prospective uh, transatlantic deal, bilateral deal, uh, without uh, suggesting that it's a competitive business or too competitive a business. Is it more likely that the um, who is likely to get there first? Is the European Union likely to get a, a deal with the United States in advance of uh, the United Kingdom? What's your sense of that? I've noticed the comments of any of the partners around the world that the United Kingdom have tried to negotiate a, an agreement since the 31st of January, since the withdrawal agreement was implemented. And uh, all of the partners, I think, have indicated, including Korea today, uh, South Korea, that they, they were prepared to wait to see the outcome of the Brexit negotiations before they come to any conclusions about their bilateral agreement. I suspect it'll be the same with the United States. You know, they will want to see how... Uh, the issues that, are, that the United Kingdom are dealing with the European Union first, because after all, we have 450 million people in the European Union. Uh, uh, there is about 60, 70 million people in the United Kingdom. Yeah, yeah. Mark, size matters in trade, Michael. Yeah, absolutely. So just a, a query here, a question here from Barry Andrews, our, our MEP. Um, uh, and indeed my predecessor in this job. Um, uh, he says, thank you uh, for your presentation, Commissioner. Does the Commissioner have a view on the development of a foreign investment screening mechanism for Ireland, similar to those developed in other EU member states? Well, there's 14 member states at the moment have set up foreign direct investment screening. And uh, between now and October, when the full implementation of the regulation comes into, into effect, I expect that every member state will have one. I noticed in recent weeks since this pandemic uh, unfortunately came on us that there is a lot more interest in member states to ensure that they are uh, prepared for any vulnerabilities in, in key sectors in the European Union. 
and in the recent Ministerial Trade Council, this was emphasised a lot by member states who do not have a screening mechanism to date, but they are certainly fast-tracking their plans to have one uh, in the coming months. And um, I think Ireland has a, has, a, has, a, has a screening mechanism at the moment, but I'm sure it'll be looking at strengthening it between now and October. Okay. A question here from Alan Matthews, the TCD Emeritus Professor of European Agriculture. Could the Commissioner elaborate on how the sustainable development chapters in uh, free trade agreements could be strengthened with particular reference to the uh, Mercosur FTA awaiting ratification and what role uh, the Chief Trade Enforcement Officer might play in the future? Yes, well, as you know, Alan, uh, the market access gives you the leverage in order to get the gains that we make on sustainable development and trade and sustainable development now in an integral part of our trade policy and any of the free trade negotiations in the future that we will engage in, it'll be the Paris Climate Agreement will be a prerequisite uh, uh, in terms of its adoption by the third country that we're negotiating it would, otherwise we will not get a mandate from the European Council or the European Parliament and otherwise it would not be approved subsequently. So you can see that trade and sustainability in the context of a European Green Deal Digital trade, digitization are all ratcheting up uh, very much. And we have been in touch with the Mercosur countries to, uh, in, in respect of this, and we have laid it on the line, as it were, that, uh, that the implementation of our trade and sustainability chapter is very important to engage with even in advance of the ratification of any such agreement. So we have working groups being established now to look at, as the same way as we did with uh, our EU Vietnamese uh, trade agreement to see the implementation of the trade and sus sustainability chapter front loaded as it were because a lot of the market access issues will not be um, you know put into effect or come into effect for about seven or eight years so i think you can rely on the fact that this agenda item in res respect of trade and sustainable development is going up the political agenda and will become more and more important as the years the months and years go by and i will be including this as part of my trade policy review uh, which I've announced recently and which I'll have completed by the end of this year. The Chief Trade Enforcement Officer will be, a, will, be, will be established in June, and this is about implementation and enforcement of all aspects of our trade agreements, of which we are 40. And this includes not, not just market access to get better benefit, benefits for our SMEs, but also it includes the implementation of all aspects of trade and sustainable, uh, sustainability and all the other 20, 25 chapters that we have in our standard uh, model of our free trade negotiations. So I want to assure Alan that trade and sustainability go hand in hand. Okay, thank you. Um, a question here from Adrian van den Hoven, the Director General of Medicines, or Medicines for Europe. Commissioner, thanks for the great work you have done to help secure the supply of critical ICU medicines for Europe during the crisis. Uh, look forward, looking forward, you talked about an open and strategic economy uh, for sectors like pharmaceuticals. How can we increase our strategic manufacturing capacity and resilience for medicines while avoiding a dumb, as he says, protectionist initiatives like we see in some countries? Yeah, well, we have to do both. We have to continue to have our open supply chains because we will never have a situation where we can manufacture everything in the European Union. As I said earlier, then we need imports for the purposes of manufacturing many of the products within the European Union itself. But we, are, we, have, we have certainly a vulnerability in one or two sectors, and particularly the health area demonstrated that. We were dependent totally on China for medical supplies, for India for some pharmaceutical products. And therefore, we have to assess now what supports we can give industry in order to produce some of those products. And the role of science and research and innovation is going to be critical to this area as well. So we have to be, evaluate the lessons learned from this COVID-19 pandemic to see how we, where we are vulnerable and where we can, as I said earlier, maybe look at the precedents created by the oil crisis of the 1970s, where strategic reserves and stockpiling is one way, but also more production in the European Union is another way. Uh, so you can take it that we will be helping industry in, in our industrial strategy to achieve these objectives as part of my trade policy review and as part of the implementation of our new industrial strategy. Very good. Uh, just a question here from um, Alicia Daly from J&J. &J. Um, uh, thanks for the excellent presentation. Um, acknowledge the great work of Commissioners Breton and um, uh, Kyria Kides uh, with uh, the healthcare industry since the start of the pandemic on shortages, export bans, etc., with weekly calls. What would be very helpful, though, is a clear predictive data from ECDC to allow manufacturers a forecast future demand. 
We should just want to get your thoughts on this. Well, this is why we established the Clearing House about two weeks ago. And uh, again, as I emphasize, the Clearing House information is only as good as the, as the information and data we get from the member states. We cannot force member states to give us the information. And sometimes for competitiveness reasons, they believe that withholding information is a good idea. It's not a good idea. We can, have, we can do a lot together if we have the full picture and we can identify the shortages of products so that we can help to achieve the objectives that have been outlined by, uh, by your speaker. Just a question uh, of my own. Uh, just, we haven't spoken much about China, even though it's obviously very much in the news. And, um, uh, but just uh, the question of whether and how the EU can steer, uh, I suppose, a safe course between uh, the US and China uh, in an environment, I suppose, where we as the EU are under increasing pressure uh, to take sides, how much of the, how much do you see that as being a difficulty in this kind of post an extra difficulty in this post COVID environment? Well, obviously, there's a lot of tensions rising between the United States and China, and uh, even though there was a lot of uh, goodwill generated between them in terms of this Phase One trade agreement that they agreed in January 2020, uh, it certainly there's going to be pressure on the implementation of this agreement now, inevitably, because of the way that things have developed economically for both the United States and for China in terms of achieving those objectives. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the World Trade Organization, which is, provides the rules and disciplines by which we work together, is very important. And I'm disappointed that the United States have opted out of the World Trade Organization for the moment uh, by not agreeing to the independent dispute resolution mechanisms that, are, uh, that have been in place since 1995. And I think that they should you know, re-enter the discussions about how we can reform the World Trade Organization for the purposes of making sure that we have a level playing field globally between the United States between, and China, and that China certainly uh, uh, does not continue with its subsidization of state-owned enterprises and uh, foreign tr technology or, or, or forced technology transfer. And we have recently signed up to a statement with the United States and Japan in order to have the question of industrial subsidies looked at intensively. And we're bringing that to our members of the WTO now in an outreach and in an intensive way to see can we get support for this on a plurilateral basis. Uh, this is the way I think that we can do a lot more together than separately by global cooperation rather than confrontation. And we see building up now between now and the presidential elections in the United States, there is going to be as they say in old-fashioned terms, uh, between those two entities, and this is not going to be good for anybody. Now, the, Uni the European Union at the same time is engaging in the, with China in an investment agreement, and we're making progress. And we have set a target of completing these negotiations by the end of this year. Uh, and if we do get the reforms that we need in state-owned enterprises and for industrial subsidies and issues like forced technology transfer, I think this would be very helpful to everybody and that we can embed this in the WTO process for the benefit of all countries in the world. And I hope that China will be able to uh, you know, bring themselves to understand that this is a very big problem and that we need to have action in these areas. Otherwise, we're going to have confrontation in another way. Very good. Um, another query here, a question from Shona Murray, the Brussels correspondent of Euronews. What are the implications if the trade agreement, um, if trade agreement is not negotiated by the end of the year with the UK? And the UK says it's adamant. Um, the UK said it, it says that it's 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 adamant that it will um, that that it won't agree to EU standards on level playing field issues. Is there any way around this so that the UK isn't perceived as a rule taker? I think there are ways uh, that should be explored. The level playing field, governance, fisheries—they are all important issues that. And of course, the implementation of the withdrawal agreement is is going on in parallel, particularly around the. Irish protocol. So all of these issues are on the table at the moment, but they need a lot more intensive engagement than we've seen in the last few weeks and months. And uh, if we want to achieve uh, the outcome that is preferred by the United Kingdom to have a deal by the end of the year, we need to get, we need to get on with the job. Uh, and uh, the European Union has a mandate. It's well known what our mandate is. Our member states are guiding us in terms of what we can or cannot do. Uh, and there's certainly the, the high-level meeting that will be at the end of June will be a critical meeting in terms of seeing what we can or cannot do and how many chapters we can agree across the areas, including the ones that will be mentioned by Shona. Okay. Um, I think you mentioned the question of, of, of leadership uh, on several occasions, and there's a few questions in, in relation to the, perhaps the absence of political leadership, the absence of leadership maybe in other sectors as well. 
Uh, does it worry you or is it of, is it of concern just um, perhaps that there is a deficit of leadership on some of these key areas of the economic, um, um, uh, social, um, political, um, and not just, uh, you know, generally on a global scale, maybe um, that there's a deficit there at the moment, which is um, uh, presents extra challenges in, in the current COVID environment. Well, I think that it's, leadership really is about working together, and I, I, it's certainly difficult to get people to work together at the moment uh, in various regions of the world. Uh, everybody, uh, and of course, there are personalities involved in this as well, and there's an election in the United States which we have to take into account. Uh, but at the end of the day, we can see that over the years, whenever there was a crisis, including the financial crisis of 2008, when we worked internationally together, we got good results. When we see what we did together in global cooperation on trade, you know, we really ratcheted up the importance of trade in terms of job creation because of exports. We have 35 million jobs now in the European Union depending on exports. As I said earlier, 16 million jobs and, uh, relating to foreign direct investment. So if we do work together on trade, if we do work together in, uh, in, in you know, health is an area which is a member state competence of the European Union. It's not a European competence. But we are doing our best to coordinate the member states so that they can get, have joint procurement for medical supplies so that we can have coordination in relation to transport, opening green lanes to keep products moving, in, uh, keeping the borders open. So we've played our part in that. But of course, uh, it takes everybody uh, in the European Union to be working together in a cohesive way to show leadership. It takes everybody globally to work together to show that we can work out this together in terms of the, especially, especially the, the post-COVID economic recovery. And uh, the, 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 his, the history uh, of these uh, crises in the past have demonstrated that when we work together, we can solve these issues much more speedily. Absolutely. So um, just um, uh, uh, one or two more queries. I think we're going to, um, I don't think we're going to get around to all the questions, unfortunately, but uh, we'll get around to a few more before uh, the commissioner has to take his leave. Uh, so just a question here from Bill Emmett, the former editor of The Economist, uh, now I think living in Ireland. He said, yesterday's decision by the German Constitutional Court in effect proclaimed the superiority of German national law over EU law and EU treaties. What are the implications of this for collective economic policies in trade, state aids, fiscal and monetary affairs, and how can this be resolved? That's quite a, quite a big question. Yes, well, the, the answer to that is Germany are signatories of the European treaties where the supremacy of the, the European law supersedes national law. And that's the position. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the European Central Bank now is, uh, is, 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 has, is obliged to take certain actions if it wishes in relation to bonds that, uh, bonds that have been mentioned in that decision. Uh, and we wait and see what the European board, of, uh, the board of the European Central Bank is going to do on this. But I can assure you that the European Commission, as the guardian of the European treaties, will be doing everything uh, to ensure that the European Court of Justice and the, the legal adjudication of matters at a European level uh, continue to be understood by every member state that they supersede national law. Okay, just a question here from John Whelan, uh, who I think is an international trade consultant. He has, um, just coming back to the transatlantic um, prospective agreement, he says, Hello, Commissioner, how will the EU handle digital trade in the transatlantic agreement and how does the EU take in the OECD stance on digital taxation? Well, we, we are working with the United States, as I said earlier, in relation to a number of areas on industrial subsidies, which we signed up to with Japan and the United States in, in January. We are equally prepared to talk to the United States about setting up a structure where we can work together on digital trade. I think it's a very important area. With the developments in international digital trade are huge and the speed by which they're uh, which they're going at is enormously challenging for policymakers. And uh, there is a battle, I suppose, ongoing globally to see whoever gets there first in a number of innovations, especially around AI, are, you know, they're going to have a distinct advantage. So we are uh, asking the United States to cooperate with us in a more structured way. And uh, I think we're making progress on that. Trade and technology uh, and, and the digital trade area in particular are going to be hugely uh, interconnected in the in the years ahead and then we want to work with the United States in order to ensure that we set the standards not somebody else um, and second question second part of the question for John I've just forgotten it for a minute uh, he says uh, how does the EU take in the OECD stance on yeah. uh, well we've had a we've, we, we, we have a we have a standstill at the moment in these negotiations uh, rising from a deal that was struck between the European Union and the United States earlier on digital taxation 
and we want the, the OECD to continue its work and to come to uh, a reflection of these with all the OECD members by the end of this year. So this is going to be a December uh, project, I suspect. And I suspect it is uh, timed for being after the United States presidential election. Just to, to, to bring it back home just a little bit, Commissioner, uh, on the issue of uh, strategic autonomy, how worried should we be in Ireland about its growing emphasis on strategic autonomy? Um, uh, obviously, individual member states have spoken strongly, the French, I think uh, Macron in particular, has spoken about uh, the necessity to, to, um, to, to reshore or nearshore or bring back certain strategic industries. Uh, what, what do you see, I mean, uh, 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 as the prospective implications or indeed maybe opportunities for Ireland in this respect, shouldn't we be worried? Well, I think Ireland has a, uh, has a vested interest in making sure that we have the most open rules-based trade uh, potential in, uh, globally uh, than any other country in the European Union. For, uh, you know, for many of our sectors, 80% of what we produce is exported. So we have a vested interest in ensuring that the, 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 the global supply chains remain open, that the, that the restrictions are lifted. And in the context of policy, I expect that the vast majority of the European Union member states will want to continue on the same basis as we have now in terms of an open rule based multilateral approach based on a reformed and effective WTO. And they will also want to see more free trade agreements and that they're implemented better and that there's better benefits from them from the, for SMEs. But of course, as I mentioned earlier, we have found during this crisis that we need to diversify and we need to look at, we cannot be dependent on China or South Korea or countries like that for all our medical supplies or India. We have to look at ways in which we can actually reduce this vulnerability. And stockpiling and reshoring is one way of doing it. And for there, and, and the French commissioner and I, we agree on this, that for vulnerabilities, we have to do something to ensure that we have a product available to our citizens at a time of crisis. And that can be produced locally, or it can be actually imported from abroad to, and stockpiled within the European Union. Uh, no, we can do both. Here's a question from um, uh, Sebastian Messier, uh, who's from uh, uh, Merck, from a German, is a German pharmaceutical company, of course. Thank you for this very interesting discussion. You spoke about the importance of open trade and the damage caused by tariffs. Uh, do you see an opportunity for the EU to lead towards updating the WTO's zero for zero agreement on pharmaceuticals? He says it hasn't been updated since 2011. Yes, I agree that this is what we should do. We should update and find more members to join our WTO pharmaceutical agreement because uh, re eliminating tariffs uh, is one way of where we can be helpful in this pandemic and into the future for an essential uh, medical supplies. As we've seen, they're very much essential and uh, we have to prepare better for the future in terms of a future pandemic. But reducing costs is one of them. And we have unilaterally in the European Union already on a temporary basis eliminated tariffs and VAT in respect of medical supplies. So we are, we are voting with our feet in relation to this matter in terms of the actions we have taken ourselves unilaterally. Very good. Um, so uh, a question here from, um, um, just want to know, not trying to be uh, facetious, it's a genuine question, how much longer export restrictions are going to be a factor of EU trade policy? Uh, given this is about using trade as a way out of the crisis, can't ignore uh, the fact restrictions on exports are currently part of the overall response uh, strategy. This is from Ali Renison, the head of the EU Trade Policy, the IOD in the UK. Well, we don't have export restrictions in terms of European policy, but there are a number of member states that have engaged in restrictive practices, which we are uh, certainly not happy about. And the European Commission is... Uh, talking to those countries initially in order to remove those trade restrictions, uh, some of which are totally unnecessary and completely out of kilter with the single market. And if those restrictions are not lifted, we will have to look at infringement proceedings against those member states. We are taking very strong action in terms of protecting the integrity of the single market, of course, which one of the principal architects of establishing the single market was Margaret Thatcher. Indeed. Um, I, I, just in terms of the time scale, um, obviously 2020 is going to be um, a, a, obviously a very, very difficult year. Um, when do you see a trade um, in, in a best case scenario returning to anything like the levels of pre-COVID? Pre a number of years, I'm afraid, uh, Michael. Uh, this is going to be a slow uh, situation where you have to build up all of the various changes that have been disrupted by restrictive practices and some of those chains unfortunately will be broken. 
So this is going to be a constant battle for the rest of my mandate in trade, I'm afraid, to uh, put, the, put the jigsaw back together again. But hopefully in the second half of this year, we will see our economies improving again as businesses get back to work, our workers get back you know, through our businesses to work, uh, and therefore we can see economic growth again. We're projecting economic activity to and economic growth to be 6% next year, provided on the assumption that we get the second half of the year that we're able to open our businesses in all of our member states uh, to a fairly large extent. Um, just coming towards, uh, we have about another five minutes, I think, Commissioner, before I think we have to, to leave, and maybe we would just um, uh, just ask one or two more questions and if, uh, give you an opportunity to wrap up as well, if, you, if you'd if like to do that. And just a question in from Alessio Virone. Uh, several media mentioned the joint French-Dutch non-paper on tougher enforcement of environment and labour standards in EU trade deals. They propose to link tariff liberal, liberalisation with the efficient implementation of sustainable development commitments. For this purpose, they suggest that tariff reductions should be divided into stages and applied only if TSD provisions are fully implemented. Would it be something the Commission would consider? Well, look, we take views from everybody and we we're very happy to see the French and the Dutch getting together uh, uh, to produce a paper. Uh, it, it was built largely around uh, trade and sustainability uh, and, and the chapters associated with sustainability and climate. Uh, I didn't mention much about market access, but it links mark, uh, tariffs to these issues that you've just mentioned. Um, my, my, my view is that uh, there is going to be always an emphasis and more and more growing emphasis from the Council and the Parliament to be more ambitious on trade and sustainability. How we do that, of course, is open to question. But of course, we must remember there is another third party at the other side of the table that if you make uh, the situation uh, difficult for them, you'll either pay a price in concessions you have to make in other areas or you won't have a deal at all. So how, how we do that is certainly open. It's an interesting proposition that the French and the, and the Dutch paper has put forward. And of course, we'll consider every, every idea like this in terms of uh, the review of our trade policy, which will be going on between now and the end of the year. Okay, um, just uh, maybe just one, uh, one, one or two, uh, one, one final question, if I may. Did you, you mentioned the, uh, the export authorization scheme. Um, and, and, and its effectiveness, um, but I just, I'm just interested in knowing how difficult it has been uh, balancing the, uh, the medical supply needs of the EU member states uh, with all the sensitivities that are around that and authorise the exports to other countries outside the EU. I, I think you mentioned in your remarks that 90% of applications were granted. Um, I mean, obviously there has been some sensitivity about intra-EU um, uh, trade in some of these um, sensitive pharmaceuticals and uh, uh, PPE um, equipment. Um, how Getting the balance right between managing our local needs and maintaining our export markets, how difficult has that been? It's been very difficult, Michael, because in the beginning we had a lot of restrictions to trade uh, where people really closed down their borders back in early March. Uh, and because of the restrictions that they imposed, we had to bring forward a a harmonized approach through this export authorization scheme in order to get people off the hook politically, but also to understand uh, that there was going to be a monitoring arrangement where uh, if countries were not in compliance with the integrity of the single market, they were going to run into difficulties. So this was the measure that the member states agreed. Uh, it has worked fairly well, but of course, as I said in my previous reply, there are still some restrictions which are unacceptable. Uh, but I think that by and large it could have been a lot worse if we didn't put in this uh, authorization scheme and to balance that with some of the desire of some member states to be restrictive. Um, we did, uh, you know, I think that this scheme really where it has been successful is uh, not on the political side in, in dealing with some of the earlier restrictions but equally monitoring where the products were being developed, who was developing them and that there were actually those scarce supplies were where they were going to. And I'm glad that 90% of them were going to the European Union. Uh, and, uh, but it shows from the figures that I have you know, that we weren't uh, averse to exports going to the United States or Russia either, provided that there was a humanitarian issue involved where there was a need for uh, emergencies. And uh, we lifted any authorizations uh, from those particular companies that could display and show that there was a humanitarian issues involved in a crisis of an emergency involved as well in other parts of the world. We've adjusted that authorization in recent times to include the Western Balkans as well for that purpose. Thank you, Commissioner. We're just, we're just at the limit of your time here, so we're going to have to let you go. Um, um, I, I think you've covered nearly everything. I don't know whether there's any final remarks you want to make. 
uh, uh, just trying to wrap things up. Yeah, just to thank you very much, uh, Michael and the IEA for, and the European Commission for coming together to organise this. I, uh, you know, certainly is the, it's the new way of telling the story, the way we're doing this today, and I hope that people got the latest state of play in relation to uh, the information that I have and that's available. You know, it's going to cost a huge amount of money at the end of the day in order to, re to reboot our economies. The European Commission is talking about a budget now uh, of multi the multi financial framework and then a recovery fund on top of that of 1.5 trillion euros. So it's not going to be small money, but it's needed in order to ensure that we get back people back to work, we get our economies up and running again. Of course, uh, and this is the secondary issue, of course, or the overriding issue is to make sure our people are healthy and safe and that the best possible care and attention is given by our frontline services who are doing an excellent job. So we're working as best we can together to make sure that we keep all avenues open and we work in cooperation with each other and the European Commission stands ready to continue this coordination role across the board, uh, and we will do our best. We'll never get everything right, but we will certainly do our best to coordinate the member states to get as much as we can right in the interests of our people. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, and, and thank you to the more than 700 people who joined us as part of this uh, webinar. Um, we, uh, we thank you, Commissioner, for, for, for your contribution, and good luck with all of the challenges ahead. Uh, we'd like to invite everybody who um, uh, um, avails of our webinar ser services and, um, and, and, and facility and to, to stay in touch with us. Uh, we have another uh, a major um, uh, webinar coming up on Friday where we'll have the Polish Minister of Foreign Affairs, Simon Coveney, uh, speaking to us. Uh, but whether it's on that occasion or future occasions, please do stay connected with the, the IAA during these times through the medium of the webinar. And in the meantime, stay well and stay safe. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.